Yeah, hey everyone. Um, thanks for having me here today, and uh, welcome to this uh, short session about uh, large language models. Um, so when we talk about large language models, I think yeah, by now we are all aware that uh, they're going to stick around <laughs> probably for a while, um, and that they also actually unlocked already uh, quite many exciting new use cases. I think the pace that we see how things really go also into products is amazing. Um, still, I feel that there are sometimes like, kind of two realities out there. Um, on the one side, there's this crazy buzzword when I open my Twitter feed, um, where everything seems possible, everything seems so easy, countless demos, awesome. And then there's kind of industry reality when I talk to engineers, talk to product managers, um, when they try to bring maybe a first demo to production, that's a bit different. And today I wanted to talk basically a bit more about the second world, a bit more about the kind of industry practice, and um, yeah, basically over the last five years, I think by now, uh, we at DeepSight worked with yeah, more than 50 enterprise customers, I would say, thousands of open source users, um, and uh, always tried like, to build NLP into their products. Since last year, this pretty much involved LLMs. Everyone at least wanted to try, wanted to compare. Um, by today, I would say yeah, we don't see any new user or customer uh, who doesn't at least want to give it a try. So I want to share today a bit of our learnings from that uh, journey. Um, some of the challenges we also saw with our uh, users when building LLM applications um, and a few maybe techniques or tips how to overcome them. So before we start, uh, yeah, what's kind of my relation to, to NLP and large language models? So um, we founded um, DeepSet five years ago, basically with this vision of embedding NLP into every enterprise product that is out there, really making kind of a language interface to products. And we did and still do that by building two products. Uh, one is an open source framework called Haystack, which basically s helps single developers to compose LLM pipelines, agents from different underlying components uh, like models, vector da databases, uh, but also many processing steps that you really need to have a fully working application like PDF converters, all that stuff that, is, that doesn't make, make a lot of fun to code up yourself. Uh, and then we have DeepSet Cloud, which is uh, our commercial end-to-end uh, -end platform um, that yeah, is really targeting teams uh, in a company that build, deploy, monitor these LLM applications, so the whole life cycle and really work, working more as a team uh, and collaborate on it. So what can you expect in the next kind of 30 minutes from me? Um, I will structure my talk into these three parts. First, I give you some... Um, background um, to the, say, one like, typical challenges um, overall when moving LLMs to production, um, but then also focusing on one particular, which is around quality, ensuring that the model really works, fighting hallucination. Um, second, I will then introduce to you one key technique um, that I think by now every developer in that space should have uh, in his, his or her toolbox. Um, and third, um, uh, uh, I will share some further tips what you can do beyond that, that one method. Uh, in the middle, there will be also a demo part. Uh, so uh, let's see some, some live demo and live coding. Uh, let's cross fingers that everything works today. So uh, let's get started with the most typical challenges when, uh, when moving LMs to production. Um, number one. Most of these, say, high-value use cases that we see uh, in, in bigger companies um, typically include some internal company data. So it's not information data that is on the web. It's often contracts. It can be um, maintenance documents from aircrafts. Um, it can be financial reports, so a lot of sensitive data. And uh, our users typically yeah, don't want um, this to, to be exposed to ChatGPT, but also they want to tailor uh, 
their, let's say their, their answers, their responses really to the use case they have, to the domain, giving this kind of domain knowledge into the model. Um, so typical questions are then basically, yeah, how can you do that? How can we tune the model to our data? How can we teach it about this internal company knowledge that we have? Um, and and yeah, there are ways to overcome that, of course. Um, second challenge, yeah, quite related uh, to the first one. If we have that private data, um, how can we keep it secure, safe? How can we maybe keep it in our own VPC or our network? Um, what options do we have beside uh, the big big model providers like uh, like OpenAI? Third challenge, yeah, if we uh, covered the first two, made it there, um, it's often then about okay, how can we scale? Like not only in technical terms of um, let's say latency and throughput, this is also uh, quite challenging, um, but also more often in terms of uh, actual costs and model performance. So there's really, I would say, this triangle where you need to find out for your use case what really matters, like latency or costs or model performance. And depending on your use case, the answer might look very different. It's really about finding there the, the right balance. Next big question is typically then around quality assurance, um, especially before you go in production. Um, I think we all saw by now these models hallucinating, simply making up answers, and if that's an application that is exposed to your, to your customers, to your end users, this could be extremely damaging to your brand. And that's what we get right now a lot. How can we make sure that this model behaves as we want? How can we sure that it doesn't harm our brand? We want to try out, yes, but is it really ready for production? Um, so. Yeah, how do you know that it's safe enough as an engineer? How can you assess that quality in a, in a systematic way? And last but not least, um, yeah, many people forget that LLMs are technology. Um, so like with, I would say, every technology, it will only create user value if, your product, uh, if it's embedded in your product in the right way. So I think simply launching a chat interface next to your product is probably not a good idea. Um, you really need to think, okay, what's, what kind of workflows, where does it make sense, what will be the dialogues that people have, or what might be other ways where we can leverage LLMs. Um, and also iterate, like classic product work. Um, discover, prototype, iterate. I think this is uh, very much true also for, for LLMs. So I could probably talk about all of those challenges for hours, um, but yeah, today I just want to zoom into basically um, those two. Um, so how can we teach um, our model private data, private knowledge? And second, uh, about quality assurance, how can we avoid hallucination and, and in general, uh, good answer quality? So let's just quickly start with the basics. Hallucination, you see it there. Um, what is it actually and why does it happen? So LLMs uh, are often wrong with their answers, but that's not the problem. The problem is that they are very confident about it, even though they are wrong. Um, so some of you might remember this bank that used to be around, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, if you ask an LLM if that bank collapsed, you easily get an answer like this. Um, this is what we call hallucination. The model is simply living in an alternative reality, making up a fact. Make a fake fact. Um, so let's try something else. What if we ask, why did Silicon Valley Bank collapse? And now what you see, the, the model actually switches its opinion. <laughs> so it's also not very stable in uh, its conviction. Um, so now it says, oh, yeah, 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 sure, SVB collapsed, yeah, yeah. Um, it's even giving us some arguments why that bank collapsed. Uh, it's mentioning subprime mortgages, uh, financial crisis of 2008. Um, so I'm, I'm very bad with like, timelines and, and remembering stuff, but even I know that, uh, that uh, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed this year, and there was nothing uh, with like, subprime mortgages or, or financial crisis related to it. Reasons were very different. So this kind of behavior is really what causes problems when you as an engineer develop such an application. Model is not stable, 
giving wrong answers, but very eloquent in its argumentation. So hard to spot for you, hard to spot for users. Um, uh, that's the kind of challenge. Um, where do these hallucinations come from? So well, in this case, it's actually rather easy. The model, uh, uh, the GPT model that I ask here, uh, has a knowledge cutoff in September 2021, so that when it was trained, everything afterwards simply not known by the model. So yeah, okay, fair enough, the model cannot know this. Um, uh, unfortunately, that's not the only reason for hallucination. So even if you have, uh, let's say, queries or questions, cases that only rely on that old data before 2021, um, uh, you can actually end up with hallucination. So let's try something like this. Um, here we have a question, how many Model 3 vehicles were produced by Tesla in Q1 2018? So clearly before the knowledge cutoff. And, um, and the model produced an answer. That answer sounds again quite convincing. It even mentions a, a source, like the shareholder letter where it found that information. Um, yeah, the only problem is the number is wrong. <laughs> so uh, that's actually not the number that, that Tesla produced there. It was more like uh, I think 9,700 9, vehicles. So why did the model hallucinate here? Um, different options. One might be that the model just hasn't seen any of that information still at training time. So maybe it hasn't come across the right information on the web. I would say it's quite unlikely. There's a lot of information about Tesla. Even the shareholder letter really exists. Uh, it's mentioning it here. So probably more likely a uh, trigger for, for hallucination here is that the model has actually seen some related information, maybe even the shareholder letter, but then at generation time just mixes up the numbers. And this is pretty bad. And this is uh, uh, it's hard to actually uh, um, circumvent. All right, so now that we know what hallucinations are, how can we reduce them? Um, how can we also make the models aware about updated information, recent information, our own data? Um, turns out that there's one key method that really helps, um, and it's called retrieval augmentation. And I will explain you now the key idea of this method. So let's first see how a standard prompting works with an LLM. Like no retrieval augmentation, just the kind of basic stuff. We have a question. Um, this question can embed in some kind of prompt. You can give some more instructions, maybe around the style or something. This prompt we then feed to, a, to an LLM, and that LLM produces an answer. Well, simple. Now, with retrieval augmentation, we still have here our question on the left. We still have a prompt that uh, gets fed to an LLM. However, what we do now is basically to insert some information in our prompt, what you see in uh, green here. So you want to give more context to the model at, uh, at prediction time. And in our example of Silicon Valley Bank, that might be, I don't know, a financial report, like an analyst report or some journalist article uh, that explains the collapse of the bank. Of course, we need some automatic way of inserting that kind of relevant uh, document piece or that relevant text into our prompt. We can't always do that hand by hand and type something in. So what we can do is um, basically pulling, uh, connecting our model to a database, might be a vector database, might be even something simpler, uh, and have a retriever model um, that actually fetches and searches for the most relevant documents in our database and then uh, inserts those into our prompt. So in Nano here at, at Berlin Buzzwords, there's a big information retrieval community. Good news, this is like, I would say, more relevant knowledge than ever. Um, this is really key to improve your, uh, uh, I think, LLM applications. So if we do that now, the good news is we can reduce hallucinations because we can kind of ground the model generations on these documents. We can teach recent information, private information, whatever we have here in our database. Um, and last but not least, it helps with explanation. So you can show to your users, hey, where is this answer com coming from? What are the sources behind it? Um, so let's see it in action. And let me try to switch now to a demo. So you can build all of that uh, yourself 
with open source. So this is like a simple uh, streamlit application on Hugging Face Hub, everything published, also the code. And what we can do now is, let's pick one of our examples here. And we see here side by side um, the model uh, generated by plain GPT. So just really query in, answer out. And, um, and then on the uh, bottom, uh, we see then basically a retrieval augmented um, a variant where it's um, basically pulling out articles, some news articles, and uh, feeding that then to the GPT model. Let me see if maybe the application is not <laughs> demo effect. Let's maybe just refresh that space. Let's see it again. So either open AI appears down or the hugging face space. Let's see. <laughs> I will try a local version now. Uh, I run it now as a local thing. Let's see if that helps us. Ah, here, okay, so low. seems something wrong with the Hugging Face Hub this time. <laughs> um, but now here locally, we basically get one answer from, uh, from the plain GPT pipeline, um, and then one from our retrieval augmented one, where we see, oh yeah, okay, there the model gets it right. And we can even look into the source um, that is basically was used from the model here to come up with that answer. So yeah, if you want, give it a try. It's out there, play around with it. Um, and you find it under um, retrieval augmentation SVB. And the full source code behind it is also then found here. Let me see if I can get it here over. Wait. Uh huh, the other side, okay. <laughs> All right, so full screen as well. All right, so here are also links to um, basically this demo again and a tutorial um, that guides you a bit through how you can compose that yourself in, in Python code using Haystack. Um, and how can we now go actually further and optimize this anymore? So I will go, now guide you through um, four different smaller tips that you can do on top, basically, of your retrieval augmented uh, pipelines, starting with one, prompt engineering. So there's actually a few things that you can do to improve your, your answer, and particularly now to avoid hallucination. One basic thing that you can do is allow the model to say, I don't know. That's very simple, but if you give the op this option to your model, um, it can actually help a lot to, to avoid any hallucinations and, and then rather let the models you know, say, I, I don't know, I can't tell. Um, an example prompt for that you can see here, 
um, it's really instructing it by kind of natural language to not do that. Two things that are maybe less obvious uh, when we're talking about prompts but are working astonishingly well in practice. Um, number one, instruct the, instruct the model with a different task. So, for example, here we ask a question, but it actually turns out that it helps to formulate this task rather like a summarization task and less like a question answering task. Um, and the second part, formulate, or the second thing you can do, formulate the document context like the opinion of a person. Um, both really helps to reduce uh, hallucination in practice. Uh, and there's a nice recent paper from uh, Zhu et al. where they show basically this opinion-based approach that uses hallucination. This um, summarization trick is something that we actually uh, uh, saw in, in customer projects where just tried it out and worked uh, pretty well. My intuition here is that yeah, this might be related to how the models were trained on, uh, on human feedback, where for summarizations, it's much more important that the model sticks to the actual content provided, whereas for questions, it can be maybe more kind of freestyle. Last tip about prompt engineering. Um, so you can also instruct the model to add citations in the generated answers. So we saw in this uh, small demo um, that you can basically um, uh, yeah, um, put there a document um, and uh, in, at the, in the UI basically you see the generated answer and then the source behind that. And you can even go further if you now say, oh, my, maybe my retriever gives me back 10 documents. Which of, that mo which of that document was now really used by the LM? So you can really instruct the model to have a kind of citation behind every sentence saying, hey, like that claim, that statement is coming from that document. Uh, and here you see one example prompt um, you can also find all of them on, uh, on our prompt hub, um, so prompthub.deepset.ai, uh, where you can find those for, for different kind of use cases. So um, with that, uh, I would say let's spend also a few more minutes on a, on a live demo. So we saw basically this um, uh, UI example on the Hugging Face space. Um, we now heard a bit about prompts and these kind of templates. So let me see if I can bring up my IDE here as well. And I would just like to walk you a bit through how you can actually now build this, like such a pipeline, retrieval augmented pipeline, try a few different prompts. And what we basically have here so far is a um, very basic application we have here um, a prompt node uh, from Haystack that basically allows it to wrap any large language model that is out there. You can easily switch from OpenAI to Cohere to Claude to something like local, like a hugging face local model. Um, and then you can basically forward a prompt to that kind of model. Um, and what we're asking here now in this case is like, well, who is the current CEO of Twitter? So let's uh, also run this thing. And we see down here, the current CEO of Twitter is uh, Jack Dorsey. So yeah, pretty much outdated. That is, um, I would say, quite, quite expected. Um, so what we can do next is basically now uh, uh, having a document or like giving this information, this extra information to our model. So what we could do is something like providing a document. Uh, where we basically give some, some relevant information. So maybe something like this. Elon Musk announced that. And now we need a, a prompt template where we can basically bring those together. So similar to this, what you saw on the slides, somewhere we need to insert now our document. Um, and we can probably use something similar to this. So a prompt template, given the context, please answer the question. We give some context where we join all the provided documents. We still need a question that we can actually bring in here. Uh, and an answer, yes. And now what we need to do is uh, telling our prompt node that we want to use that template. and bring all of that here 
down here together, where we say, oh, now at runtime, we provide two things, a query and, and documents. This thing here is the query. And then we pass our document from the top as well in there. So let's see if I have any typos in there or missed anything. Ah, so now we get a way better answer. Uh, Linda Jagakarino is current CEO of Twitter, so it kind of uses the extra information that we provided. So, of course, yeah, we said we want to have something automatic, so not only a single document. We really want now uh, have um, like a document store that we connect there. So let's also uh, do this quickly. So we initialize some document store. Let's pick an easy one. Uh, we write our documents to, uh, to them. It's a list. Yes. Um, and when we wrote basically those documents there, we need uh, we want to use um, vector search. So we also need to provide a model that actually creates our vector embeddings. So let's also that add this one somewhere here. Let's put it here. Um, and yeah, let's pick a basic model. Um, that looks, I think, all right. And so we now have all the components together. Now we need to combine them again to a pipeline. Let's also do that very quickly. So instead of now having here a single prompt node, we uh, create a pipeline. And we add here our nodes. Um, so yeah, the first one is a retriever. Uh, the second one is our prompt node. Um, and what you see basically is here the initial query gets into the retriever, and the prompt node gets then the documents from the, um, from the uh, retriever. The prompt node gets them from the retriever, yes. Then we need to run all of that. Um, So I have no idea if I missed something. Let's see. <laughs> ah, I think I missed some import. All right, here we go. So basically, we saw the retriever fetching the models. And again, we get now our answer. And what you would now, of course, do is scaling that up, thousands, millions of more documents, maybe picking a different um, uh, uh, vector database at that point. So let's go forward. Um, we saw that now a bit, retrieval administration and prompt engineering. Um, for the prompt engineering part, yeah, we talked about the sources, so explainability. Um, this is how you could also visualize it and then the applications really show to your users um, uh, the documents, the files behind it, these kind of sources. So one thing that, uh, I mean, if you start now building this, uh, some very smart colleagues of you might ask, uh, why do we actually need retrieval? Like, um, there are now these fancy models with 100K context window. Uh, can't we simply use them, like Claude from Entropic, for example? 
let's just paste all our documents into that context, let the model figure it out. Um, yeah, so bad news, um, this kind of sparse attention as of today doesn't scale very well, um, which means if you paste in so much of your context and there's a lot of irrelevant con uh, content in that context, you will end up with quite bad predictions. The second part is costs. So um, if you, let's pick Claude from Entropic, if you have a single request with 100K input tokens, that costs you around $1.10 as of now. This is okay if you have like, I don't know if you use it for private things and here a request, there a request. With our customers, we typically have like thousands or millions of requests per month. So you easily end up with, yeah, costs in the millions, which is like, okay, do you really want that? And isn't there like a better way? Um, and latency, yeah. So, I mean, you saw us in these demos, they open, you probably experience it yourself. The LLMs, OpenAI has quite some latency already. Um, if you just put more, <laughs> more content in it, it won't get better. The good news, yeah, like we saw retrieval and there's actually a lot of established methods that you can use, that you can really optimize uh, and, and so that you make, can make also small context windows uh, work. Um, I would yeah, recommend going for um, high precision if you optimize your retrieval pipeline, um, look into a hybrid retrieval combining BM25 with vector-based search. We saw that, I think, a couple of times uh, at this conference also to, uh, so far. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think a few of the common things. Third thing you can do um, is um, so-called self-reflection. So far, we optimized basically the input to our large language model. Maybe yeah, there's something we can do also afterwards, after we got the answer back. And turns out, yes, this is basically uh, self-reflection. Um, and the basic idea, I just want to illustrate here quickly. Um, so can again ask a model something. You give it already the relevant, say, information. Um, doesn't mean that the answer will be right. Like the model can still go wrong with it. Um, but if you kind of ask again, if you let the model self-reflect on its own answer, uh, it can actually help and improve the, um, the final, final answer. And this is what you, of course, can also put now automatically into your pipeline after each generated answer, let the model reflect again, um, and, um, and then avoid maybe spitting out wrong answers or correcting them on the fly. Okay, so now we talked a lot about reducing hallucination. Um, of course, ideally, we also want to have a way to detect that. <laughs> um, and I will maybe quickly talk like, I will keep that part now short to have some time for Q&A. Just give you the, the maybe the, now the very quick overview. There are different options how, to, how you can go with detection. Unfortunately, the, the, the short summary, none of them is perfect. None of them is actually, I would say, good right now. Um, so it's still, I would say, an un unresolved uh, field in research. There's a lot of stuff happening. First things become practical, but it's very, very early. Um, one thing that we work right now on there, kind of a sneak peek, uh, we go for a model-based approach where you have, say you have a generated answer, you have your documents, um, where you know how this information should come from that, and you can now have a kind of model afterwards, a bit like the self-reflection uh, thing, um, where you classify, is that now hallucination, yes or no? And this seems to be working well, uh, like better at, uh, uh, at least at um, as statistical measures. Um, and that's the, the basic idea. We will open source that uh, in the next weeks, so, so stay tuned. Um, and with that, yeah, um, I would like to conclude. I hope you saw that threat of hallucinations is real. It's not only about uh, also outdated information in the model. Um, hope you saw how retrieval augmentation as a technique can help um, not only to reduce hallucinations but also to connect the model to your own private company data. Um, I shared a few of these further tips, directions, uh, what you um, might want to try out uh, if you want to go for forward. And uh, yeah, last but not least, um, I really want to stress that part. Controlling these failure modes is key. 
um, f not only for these rather simple pipelines and models, but even more if you think about uh, uh, chaining models, having agents, uh, where you have like a lot of calls in uh, one after the other, uh, it basically you know, kind of grows exponentially if one of these requests fails, hallucinates, it just gets propagated. So I think we as a community need to work a lot on how do we detect hallucinations, how do we measure quality, um, so that really agents can move to production. And with that, um, yeah, I would like to uh, end it. Thanks for your attention and happy to yeah, um, see your questions. Do we have any questions for Malte? Yeah. Hi, and thank you for a very cool talk. Let me preface my question by saying that I think LLMs are uh, so much fun, and I'm actually working with something similar at the moment. Now that said, let's get controversial. Uh, there's no such thing as an hallucination. The, um, these models are extremely, it's an impressive how often they are right at doing exactly what they should do, which is producing delicious sounding strings, right? And then we uh, uh, attributed truthfulness or usefulness post hoc, right? And then when discussing uh, these limitations, especially outside of the core NLP community with the wider tech community, these things tend to be treated, treated as bugs or things that we can patch, right? Have you guys seen that goofy uh, cartoon uh, episode where he's in the boat and the boat is sinking and there's lots of uh, holes and he tries to uh, fill the holes with his fingers and toes, right? Mm -hmm. this, is, like, this is feeling increasingly more like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Still, remember my preface. I'm working with this. I think it's fun. It's great. And I'm interested to uh, know your thoughts uh, about this. Like, do you think we're still going to uh, be goofy in the sinking boat in one year uh, or two? What do you think? I um, mean, first of all, yeah, I think I see the same boat. <laughs> um, and I think that's like what's basically holding many folks uh, back from moving to production. So either, I don't know, you have the sinking boat in a prototyping stage, or maybe we're brave, you went to production, then it's like, okay, yeah, what should we do? Um, I hope that in one year or maybe two, I don't know about the timeline, uh, we get better. I think one thing that is missing right now a lot is like, um, I think the whole part about prompt engineering is kind of witchcraft. <laughs> like, you get something to work, okay, then you feel comfortable, oh, but it's like all based on samples. Yeah, it's not very systematic. Um, and then you move to production and things fail. So I think um, what's right now missing a lot is similar to classic software development, you have some kind of quality assurance at, say, dev time. You may do some local testing, local debugging. That's for me the prompt engineering part. We try to get something work. Um, but then I think we, we are basically blank on anything that follows. So if you think about a CI, what do you run in a CI for LLMs like to ensure that this uh, like still works and is systematically working? And uh, if it's in production, like what's your kind of maybe data doc equivalent? Like what can you uh, do on observation side? Um, so I think this is, I mean, it's the whole field is developing so f quickly. Um, it's maybe also fair to not have it yet, but uh, I, would, I would bet that, yeah, I will really believe that we need it, and I think there will be tooling that allows that. Um, two thi like maybe one thing, I'm not sure how you do it, but it's um, measuring like, the uh, user feedback in a systematic way. I think there's something that helps us bridging this. We have an online question. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing retrieval argumentation. What are your views on this method affecting costs for the API call? Since for each call, we would need to pass additional tokens consisting of context or domain specific information. Would this still keep this API call, co API call cost effective versus building and maintaining in-house solutions? Mm -hmm. uh, very good question. So um, yeah, really depends, I would say, on the use case. So if you remember that slide with the typical challenges, scaling it up their costs become a really a part of the equation. Um, so typically what, uh, what we see is not, like not pasting, I know, dozens of documents in there for, for this retrieval block manager generation, but rather maybe two, three, five short uh, passages. So you would cut your files into you know, smaller passages and only kind of feed those in so that the overall request length is not 
not going crazy, not by far not using the, uh, we are at least not far by far using the uh, available context windows in, in most cases. Um, still, it's, uh, I think, um, yeah, everyone should do some cost calculation, what kind of provider makes sense. They are hugely different. So we did, a, like last week, a kind of back of envelope calculation on different providers, also on self-hosting. And um, yeah, it, it really, I think the range was from, like we had one million requests with around about 1K token length. Um, and the range was from, I think, 1,000 euros up to 300,000 euros, just by different providers, different models. Um, so really think what you need from a model perspective and how much, um, uh, what's your trade-off between maybe accuracy and, um, and costs. Thank you. We are unfortunately out of time, so thank you for coming. <laughs>